mentioned it in the clip, how do you get the torque onto the road? That was at the time quite unique. Now, how do you well, see the Audi Quattro with an open diff that was manually locked in comparison to an S5 of today with the last iteration of our self-locking mid-diff? Well, I think you would have to go a little further back here because the idea for the Quattro, of course, was also born from the fact that in the winter test drives, a Volkswagen Iltis with an all-wheel drive system proved to be clearly better in traction than over the, well, big engine vehicles also at the winter testing. And, of course, that was um, progenitor of the idea that we should combine the best of both worlds, an all-wheel drive system with a good traction and with an engine with the corresponding performance. Which also means, of course, that a technical solution for the archaic for the first Quattro was pretty close to the solution found for the Iltis and was more focused on traction than anything else. Meaning it was an open diff. And of course, I mean, you need the diff, first of all, to have the torque leveling in cornering between front and rear axle. But of course, also has the disadvantage if I've got an open diff at that moment where I can put torque to the road, I'm always limited by the one axle that has less traction. And that means I can only put that much torque on the other axle, then that has the lower traction. And therefore, I mean, and that's also the case to this day in off-road segment cars. You've got these full differentials that simply block that torque leveling, which means on an off-road condition, I've got super traction and all the advantages, but of course, got other disadvantages. For example, in parking, I've got a tensioning of the vehicle that is not really suited to a passenger vehicle. And also uh, the brake control systems that started in the 80s were not compatible with a fully locking mid-diff. And so so, as of the middle of the 80s, one started to come up with different technical solutions. That is the self-locking mid-diffs. And you see these mid-diffs here, for example, the self-locking one, that's actually one of the first ones, the torsion type A. They have a kind of an internal um, locking mechanism. Now, what they all have in common is that the transfer of the torque is done by the helix gearing into axial forces and with that you have a friction created inside the mid diff and so this is how i can bring traction to the axle with a better um, traction than to the one with the lower traction which means traction improves but at the same time i also have this leveling effect in the diff which means in cornering i also can actually go round the bend without having the car tensioning up and so over the course of time the self-locking mid diffs have seen iterations of improvements uh, the torsion a focus was very much still on traction and then as you see here with the torsion b the focus was more on making sure that the tensioning during cornering was to be reduced in torsion type c that was actually the first solution where we had a 40-60 torque split, the basic torque split, that was more geared towards drive dynamics and the torsion CSM that we have at the moment in zero car production. That's really a combination of all of it, a super traction, great drive dynamics, and at the same time, as is here, a very compact and small build. So that if you take a look at these four, we've really cut the weight, we've saved a lot of weight, by the use of special materials and have really, well, um, achieved quite a bit of efficiency with that. William, speak quite generally, what's the characteristic features that an Audi with a Quattro powertrain shall always bring or show? Well, speaking quite generally, it should simply be easy to drive. Every customer, also those who are not, so to say, rally drivers, should feel comfortable in the winter on snow or on ice. So the car should not have too much understeer, it should not have too much oversteer, and if it ever should oversteer gently, that shall feel comfortable and should be a gradual oversteering so that a customer can actually react. Now, you just said, up until about 2005, you had the 50-50 torque split between front and rear axle. So so equal torque going to the front and to the rear axle. How did you come to actually take that step to a 40-60 torque split? Answer, well, with a 50-50 torque split, there's a bit of a disadvantage that you need to consider. If you accelerate in the corner, you never quite exactly know, is the car going to understeer or is it going to oversteer? 
And um, when you have a uh, torque split that's quite clear, that is a little less at the front, a little more at the back here, then the consequence is that the car always has a very neutral or a slightly oversteering reaction, which on snow and ice is simply the much better drive behavior. And for the customer then, a predictable? Indeed, very predictable and easy to drive for the driver or the customer. With the old system, of course, if you had a bit of exercise, you could get used to it, so that it also was predictable, but this is, I mean, only uh, for customers who are not so often on snow and ice. Dieter, let's go back to the component level. How did you achieve that um, basic torque split of 40 to 60? Well, I can show you this here by um, the mid-dip that we currently have in the S5, how that basic torque split is achieved. Now, what you see here is a 3D cutaway model, and if you look at it from the front here, that's what it would look like. So, we've got a power shaft that propels here the mid-diff, that's the power direction. And it then takes along these planetary gears shown here in red, and the planetary gears, as you can see here, then propel two different gears, that's the ring gear here on the outside, and that's the power takeoff to the rear axle, and on the inside, that's here, that's the sun gear, that's where they go to the front axle. Meaning, I've got different lever effects. So if I go from the center to the front axle and then to the rear axle power takeoff, you can see this is exactly this split 60 to 40. Meaning a long lever to the rear axle, 60%, meaning more torque and 40% less torque going to the front axle. And that's the basic torque split that we've achieved here, simply given by the geometry setup of the mid -diff. And we can also have a look at this in a technical animation that should make, it make this even clearer yet. Yes, indeed. Here you can see the basic distribution is just one element, the 60-40 torque split, and this is really only, well, applicable if both axles go at the same speed. The moment that one axle has less traction on the road, then that torque instantly will be shifted to the other axle with more traction on the road. So up to 70% can go to the front axle and up to 85% percent of torque can go to the rear axle. So the 40-60 split is a geometric basic condition and as William said means you've got this predictable and reliable behavior that you always know how the car behaves but of course in real drive situations I've got a pretty wide range of torque distribution between front and rear axle. So from theory to practice, it's always a lot of, well, fine-tuning a setup work, isn't it? I mean, that's a huge element of your daily work. And um, Dieter, you, you brought some film material from your private um, stock with you because you spend a lot of time in Sweden where you test on low friction surfaces. Maybe you can tell us a little what, what you do and how you approach this when you go to Sweden. You're quite right. I mean, there's a lot of manual work that we actually do there in Sweden. What we do is, over the course of a year, we have a number of prototypes of new mid-diffs that we develop and that we then build with different friction discs that we then want to test out or different helix angles that we want to test out. And we take all of this along with us to Sweden to the winter testing. And in these test conditions, we also have two identical cars with us. One of them becomes our referential car and the other one becomes our test car. And in these cars, we will then install, well, first of all, actually, we drive them with what they have for serial production with all electronic control systems deactivated so that we simply have a mechanical reaction from the car and also during the entire setup work we keep all these electronic control systems deactivated. And then in the one car we keep the serial mid diff and in the other one we then step by step work our way through the various prototypes until we come to a point where we say we now have a vehicle behavior that we actually prefer over the serial mid diff. And then a new one becomes our referential car and then we gradually work our way through these various prototypes and thus in iterations we try to optimize over the course of the days and to get a better, better drive behavior. When you say we, of course, it's just um, the two of you or it's quite a few of you, but William, tell me, what's it like for you at the end of the day? I think, I mean, after you've clocked up miles and miles of testing, are you always fully in agreement or do you also part company, shall we say, and say, oh, come on, let's sleep over this and we'll decide 
what we think on the next day. Well, look, of course, we have plenty of discussions during the course of the day because, of course, we drive the cars one after the other. So our two cars, we take them on the same track, we change after each lap, and then, of course, there are times where we think, ah, we're not quite in agreement how the car behaves. And then we discuss it. Sometimes we even drive together another lap to make sure that we really are in agreement. But, of course, you often find that also in the cross-country roads that are not just on frozen lakes, but also in rural areas, um, they can be 20 kilometers in length, and it could well be that uh, a truck or whatever goes ahead of you and, of course, changes the road surface conditions. And then, of course, um, you, you, you probably feel different from what your colleague felt at that same section. So we talk over it for as long until we have an agreement. And when we park company, we are always of one opinion. Yes, you're right. Up to now, we've always managed. Now, in that clip, we saw an A4 saloon. But, of course, that self-locking mid is also used in a Q8. And, and now, of course, a Q8 um, from a drive dynamics is, is, I mean, it's a big SUV. It's quite different from an A4 mid-segment saloon. So how does this work? That, that is still much the same behavior. Answer being, well, look, the reason why we take a smaller car, an A4 saloon, is because it's usually lighter and can react a little faster to, well, outside interferences and also reacts faster in changes to its all-wheel drive system. The advantage of our MLB, of our longitudinal matrix, is, of course, that all these cars have a pretty similar axle load distribution and also the axle setup is pretty similar. And so, thank God, I mean, they also react pretty much akin to changes in in uh, the torsion mid-diff. So if we have something in the S5 and then fit it to a Q8 or Q7, it's also a good mid-diff. So we take our two referential cars and also often, well, take that mid-diff, the prototype mid-diff, and put it onto an SQ7 or SQ8 that we have with us in Sweden. And, and, and always, well, have a kind of iteration fitted to the bigger cars. And the changes we've noticed in the smaller cars often hold equally true for the bigger cars. Of course, sometimes not so pronounced because, of course, that the reaction is a bit more latent. But what happened in the small car and what's good in the small car is also good for the bigger cars. Yes, the big advantage of the mid-diff is, of course, if it's, well, holistically fine-tuned with its kind of locking ratings, if it's a homogenous unit in itself, and as William said, we find what's very good in the one car is actually also very good and the best in the other car, so we don't have to make any compromises. Here. What you've done your testing in Sweden, you take that final state of the mid-diff and test them on high-friction tracks. Here, the Nürburgring is a vitally important area. How important is the Nürburgring actually for you then? Well, look, the Nürburgring is actually important for us because it really puts the entire all-wheel drive system through its paces. Because here, at a very short time, we've got different conditions with great centrifugal forces, lots of longitudinal acceleration, top speeds, top um, heat development, and here we can really test the entire all-wheel system. For example, the temperatures. How can we handle the temperatures? And of course, also ventilation, lubrication is what it should be. And here, we can also reproduce the situation very quickly, as uh, short as possible time, and create situations that would normally only appear, well, as a, as a, as a one-off. So the setup of the mid-diff is something that we always do on low friction surfaces because here we can really feel the finities much better. Then one of the last stations is close here to Ingolstadt on your internal test track, the so-called misuse testing. Now, this misuse testing is an absolute extreme situation where both car and powertrain really have to prove their metal. And we'll have a look at this. Maximum traction in almost drive dynamics and always top-notch safety or as we at Ali would say, Quattro. There's hardly a technology that in the automotive industry has shaped the image of a brand so much as Quattro has done for Audi. All-wheel drive also, of course, always means extra components, more weight and thus more fuel consumption. So at the end of the day, are all the advantages of the Quattro paying in on purchasing efficiency? And what's the potential that Quattro offers for electric mobility? These and other questions is what we will be looking at today at In The Tech Talk, efficiency and electric 